No, absolutely impossible on that type of fuel control switch. It's a mechanical switch. And that goes from run to cut off mechanically, and it opens a mechanical relay. There is no electronic component to it except for one. Join me now. So returning to Uncensored is pilot and YouTube commentator, Captain Steve Scheibner. Captain the Steve. The director of the Foundation for Aviation Safety and Boeing whistleblower, Ed Pearson, and the former air accident investigator and pilot, Captain Kishore Chinta. Welcome to all of you to Uncensored. Ed Pearson, let me start with you. Well, I want to say that it's possible it's pilot error, but I think that we need to look at all the possible system failures that could have occurred. Um, that we need to exhaust that list before we, you know, infer or implicate the pilots. I mean, sure, the uh, full report or investigation hasn't concluded, right? So logically, you know, it's not safe in general to go out in the public and start blaming folks. However, I don't think Captain Steve or anyone has officially blamed anyone except for the Wall Street Journal or perhaps uh, Reuters uh, with their articles. And I believe Wall Street Journal claims to have some sort of uh, inside source uh, providing them that information. What exactly do we now know happened here? Yeah, um, well, I mean, obviously the, the report uh, says that there were, the pilots had a conversation um, they're not even that specific about what they're talking about. So one of the real issues I want to just say right up front is there's not a timestamp detailed timeline. So it's really an incomplete report. And um, we think that's not that's really not fair. I agree. It's not a complete report. It's vague at best. So there is uh, room for educated hypothesis and some professional assumptions to be made, which, again, I think Steve has done an excellent job of. Um, no disrespect to anyone else on the panel. Um, but I kind of lean more towards uh, Steve's theory versus uh, the switches. But we'll, we'll get into that later in the video. If it wasn't the fuel control switches, what else could have caused the plane to nosedive so soon after takeoff? We have to look at these um, things called common mode failures, right? So you could have potentially an electrical uh, short circuit or some sort of arcing, um, some sort of system failure that could occur and um, these um, switches uh, and the circuitry, you know, they're in they're in parallel at certain points and certain points they come together. So the proximity and, you know, it could be potential water leaking. We've had reports of water leaking in the, into the electronic base. There was a, a federal uh, FAA administration. Um, <laughs> Steve didn't like that one. Um, so there's Steve a lot didn't of like that, that one. Need to be examined here <laughs> systems wise um, before we again jump to the conclusion that this was a pilot um, making a mistake. I have 21 years experience in IT, 17 years as a project manager. There's a thing called bugs. They're unexplained, unexpected uh, issues or problems within hardware and software. These things can occur. I'm not saying that's what occurred here, but they can occur. Key, they can occur. Okay, uh, Captain Chinter, what's your view? Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh... Uh, due respects to both the gentlemen who are former military aviators like me. I would like to begin with a quote from the FAA Handbook on Human Factors, you know. I love this quote, by the way. An accident is the final act of a chain of decisions which is made. Let's just talk about just the facts. I will just start from the liftoff. At 8.08, 39 seconds was the liftoff. And three seconds later, it says max speed of 180 knots was achieved but no altitude is mentioned. Next event is at 43 seconds. We'll assume it's 43 seconds because it says after 42, immediately a, a second later, the fuel control switches was seen to be transitioning from run to cutoff. You can see there on screen, the report doesn't say one second later. It says immediately thereafter, the engine one and engine two fuel cutoff switches transition from run to cutoff. This is an example of what I would refer to as a safe assumption. Immediately implies right away, one second later, you know, so it's safe to infer some things. And that has to be done from this perspective, from this professional aspect um, in an educated manner. Okay, 43 and 44 is when both these events happen transition okay at 47 the n2 was below minimum idle and the rat started supplying hydraulics it's not mentioned anywhere with a timestamp 
when the rat deploys. So how long does it take for the rat to deploy after an engine failure on a Boeing 787? The answer, almost instantly. The Ram Air Turbine, or RAT, is automatically deployed within one to two seconds after a total loss of both engines or AC power. My source, the Boeing 787 Aircraft Maintenance Manual, chapters 24 and 29. No pilot input is required. The system is fully automatic, designed for high reliability backup. Now, how long does it take for the rat to actually generate hydraulic power? Once deployed into the airstream, the rat needs a few seconds to spin up. At cruise speed, hydraulic pressure is typically restored within three to five seconds after deployment. Source, the FAA type certification data sheet from the Boeing 787 FCOM Volume 2, Chapter 13. From engine failure to working backup hydraulic power and electrical power, you're looking at anywhere from four to seven seconds. That's pretty quick, but during an emergency at 180 knots, time really does matter. There's a CCTV footage. We do not know the CCTV footage timestamp when actually they, at what altitude, they see the rat deployed. If you just go by this sequence of events, we do not see any reason for the rat to deploy. So practically whatever happened, happened in the first 10 seconds from the liftoff. The timestamp doesn't match up as uh, Ed already mentioned, okay. time on all these theories. Okay, Captain Steve, your response to, to what the two other guests have said. Well, there's a lot been said so far, and I wanna stick with what is written in the preliminary report. Uh, the preliminary report does have a fair amount of detail, and I'll agree, there are some things missing. I think the biggest thing is the people that wrote the report need to get in front of a microphone and answer some questions. Yeah. That's probably the number one thing. Why um, AAIB, NTSB, why haven't any of them gotten together and made some sort of official press statement? I mean, I guess they assume that the AAIB preliminary report is their statement, um, but they're not putting themselves up for questioning, for clarification on some of the things that's actually on the report. We're trying to glean what we can here based on what they gave us. However, uh, the only answer that really fits all of the parameters are that the fuel control switches, as they say in the report, transitioned from run to cutoff. That doesn't happen without human intervention. And anybody that operates those switches knows that they are spring loaded into position. They have a detent to hold them there. They don't vibrate out of position. That's never happened. It, there's no evidence that that took place at all. Um, we're thinking of some sort of theory where the engines failed and some, for some reason, some unexplained reason, the pilot or pilots would reach over and turn those fuel control switches to cut off, wait four seconds to turn them back on to run. That's not a procedure we're trained in for any situation at all. If, if there's a dual engine failure, you go to cut off and run immediately within a second of each other because you want to get those engines relit. The rat deployed so quickly because both fuel control switches were placed to cut off. You didn't have to wait for the engines to spool down. Normally on an engine failure, you would wait for the engines to spool down. If you take both of those switches to cut off, the air logic knows that the rat needs to deploy and it, it deploys instantaneously. So that explains why the rat came out so quickly. One of the... Which I just did discuss the uh, Boeing 787's uh, air maintenance manual and the uh, FAA type certification document, um, which clearly supports uh, Steve's uh, perspective here. Pilots returned the switches back to run and they stayed there. And so the theory that somehow they vibrated out of position or somehow there was something wrong with them and they ended up in their cutoff position uncommanded is just ridiculous because there's pictures of the fuel control switches in the crash, in the run position. They survived the entire G impact of the crash and the fireball afterwards and didn't budge. I agree with Steve there 100%. If there was any physically thing wrong, functionally wrong with those switches, the G forces on impact would have dislodged them once more. So I fully support Steve there. They go on to talk about some legal things, you know, blaming on Boeing. Does that really need to happen? And um, we're going to skip ahead, um, jump ahead to some more of the deeper items. I want to talk more about the uh, mechanical switches and help break that down. So let's jump ahead to that piece. Let me jump in. Just in simple layman's terms, is it possible that those fuel switches were turned off 
without human involvement. Captain Steve... I, exactly, that's where well, I'm Captain coming. Captain Steve I'm has extensive, that, uh, obviously, flying experience. He, he does not believe yeah. that is possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that. Uh, I have a background to this. I spent almost my entire military life, uh, you know, electronic warfare. So, Everyone saying those fuel switches went to cut off. Yeah. But the preliminary report doesn't mention anywhere that those physically, those switches moved. That is what is the key to the entire theory. Those switches moved, we do not know. Yes, those shut off the fuel supply, which caused the engines to lose power. Yes. Why that happened, we do not know right now. We should not... Uh, so you're, just to be clear... Or make us OK, just to be clear, you're saying that the fuel switch, the fuel supply could have cut off without these switches being turned off? Yes, it is a possibility which cannot be ruled out at this stage. OK, but also, but, but do you also... Presumably, you can't also rule out human error. You, you can't definitively say it wasn't pilot error. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I am at no point saying that you can rule out human factors at this stage uh, of the preliminary report. Captain Steve, I mean, to, to that point, that the... the fuel supply could have been cut off without human engagement. You you seem to suggest with your facial expression that you don't believe that would be possible. No, absolutely impossible on that type of fuel control switch. It's a mechanical switch, and that goes from run to cut off mechanically, and it opens a mechanical relay. There is no electronic component to it except for one that sends a signal to the FADEC on that particular aircraft so you don't over boost the engines. It's like a governor, but it's a fail safe system. So in other words, that mechanical relay opens up three valves, the spar valve, the fuel management valve, and, this, and the high pressure shutoff valve that all send fuel out to the engine. It's inconceivable that there's any sort of electronic impulse that could somehow close any one of those valves. So let's clear something up. Captain Steve says the fuel switches are mechanical. And that's kind of true, but also a little misleading. Yes, the physical switch in the cockpit is a mechanical toggle. It gives you the tactile feel like a switch on an old stereo. But what happens after you flip it? That's not mechanical at all. On the Boeing 787, that switch sends a signal into the EEC, Electronic Engine Control System, and that's a digital computer that manages all engine functions. From there, the fuel shutoff valve gets an electronic command to open or close. So while the switch is a mechanical input device, the actual action that shuts off the fuel is fully electronic. If there's a glitch, power failure, or interference in that chain, that valve may not behave the way you expect because the system relies on a digital logic to execute the order. Bugs? So no, it's not just a cable yanking at a valve. It's a mechanical switch triggering an electronic system. And that distinction matters when we're talking about why engines shut down midair. Fuel control switches are a very simple mechanism. They're mechanical, they have a mechanical relay, they open up three valves. The only way to shut off those three valves is to place the fuel control switch to cut off or pull the fire handle. Yeah, those switches are not just mechanical. If it was strictly mechanical, it would be a metal. Con it would be a connection between the switch and the actual valve itself. There's got electrical wiring. There's things that go from that switch all the way out to the airplane. I worked in a factory. I saw how these airplanes are manufactured. The, the, we had electrical issues in the factory. We had issues with testing of our electrical wiring interconnect system. We had issues in the factory with systems not working properly. Um, this is not that unusual. This, these things can happen as, as, as the other captain mentioned. Um, he mentioned he had a background in electronics and so do I in the military. And these switches are not purely mechanical. If they were purely mechanical, there would be a physical connection between that switch and whatever that end object is. And so what we need to do is we need to go through the signal flow the detailed signal flow. And these, again, I'm, I'm saying I'm not an expert because I, I value the fact that there's areas of expertise that, say, Captain Steve has, but there's areas of expertise that other people with other disciplines have. So electronic technicians, electrical engineers, systems engineers, those individuals need to be involved in this. And that's what I mean when I say I'm not an expert. We know from the cockpit voice recordings they've managed to retrieve so far, but one of the pilots said to the other, why did you cut off? And the other pilot replied he did not, that he hadn't done so. So we know that conversation happened. Absolutely. We, we do not know who said what. We do not know. We are, we are assuming that 
pilot who who was not flying. Well, 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 well again, who, again, hang on, again, again. What we're assuming is, that, and this comes down to the critical point of whether a human could actually, uh, whether this could have happened without human involvement, that the fuel switch is being turned off. So I think there's a key difference between operational and functional knowledge, and I just want to point that out. Operational knowledge refers to the understanding of how to use or operate a system, typically from a user or frontline perspective. An example, a pilot knows that pulling the fuel cutoff switches stops the fuel flow to the engine, that's operational knowledge. Functional knowledge is a deeper understanding of how the systems actually work internally, the mechanisms, signals, and system architecture that makes it all function. An example of that is knowing that the fuel cutoff switches is a mechanical input that sends signal to the electric FADEX system which then electronically controls the fuel shutoff valve. That's functional knowledge. Someone might operate a system correctly without understanding how it functions, which is fine in routine operation. But functional knowledge is critical when diagnosing failures, evaluating unexpected behavior, or analyzing accident investigations. The mechanism is mechanical. The signal path and valve action is electronic. Does an airline pilot study functional systems? Airline pilots are trained in system operation, not deep system architecture. They study how the aircraft behaves, what alerts mean, how to troubleshoot, and how to recover, mostly from an operational standpoint. Some experienced or curious pilots do go deeper into functional knowledge, but that's not universally required. They learn system logic and interactions as described in the FCOMs, flight crew operations manuals, but they don't go into engineering level detail unless they actively pursue it. Captain Steve provides insightful operational analysis flying both the 787s and 777s and breaking down what he sees in video and audio data. He clearly knows what buttons pilots push and how systems behave in cockpits, but there's no public indication that he's gone deeper into the engineering architecture, the electronic pathways, logic boards, microcontroller commands that underpin those systems. That's where functional knowledge resides. Now, based on the research that I've done, there's important distinction to make. Yes, the physical switch in the cockpit is mechanical. You flip it, you feel resistance, that's tactile. But that switch doesn't directly open or close a valve through a cable or rod like it's a lawnmower. It sends a signal to the electronic engine control, also known as the EEC, which is essentially a computer. On GE engines, it's part of the FADEX system. That electronic signal is what actually tells the fuel metering unit to command the valve, whether to start fuel flow or cut it off. So yes, it's a mechanical switch triggering an electronic process. The final actuator event is absolutely controlled electronically, not mechanically. And that's not opinion. That's documented in Boeing's own maintenance and flight crew training manuals and even Rolls-Royce and GE engine specs. You know what would solve all this, Pierce? Mm. Would be if the people who wrote this report got in front of a camera and behind a microphone. Mm. We're all here having a spirited discussion about what we think happened. The people that have the real answers, the first question I would ask the, the people that wrote this report is, what do you mean at transition from run to cutoff? Mm. To explain what you mean by the word transition. 